Yeah. All right. It's so funny. Yeah. No, actually, um, we'll probably. Okay. I'll it turn it over to you, Johanna. Thank you, Heidi. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us. Um, the topic for discussion today is about estate planning and really getting started and talking about some of the, some of the fundamental concepts related to estate planning. My name is Johanna Alex, and I'm an attorney with Stafford Rosenbaum. And um, my history with Brownswell is, is um, it dates back to actually the um, you know, 2000s, 2011 is my last year on the board. I, I um, served as board president uh, during the last few years of my tenure and helped launch the Legacy Society uh, as a way to um, help people uh, develop their legacies involving Groundswell. So it's been my pleasure to be associated with Groundswell for so many years and, and um, also a beneficiary of their, their efforts and that I um, was born and raised in Madison and have lived here um, all but just a few years of my life. So very pleased to be speaking with you today. So a couple of points to mention before we get started. Uh, first, I welcome questions. Um, there is a chat room that you can uh, post your question to, and Heidi's going to help be helping me to monitor the chat room. So I'll try to address your questions as we go along. If there's something that you um, ask that is either uh, off topic related to estate planning, but off topic that I'm currently discussing, I may just say we'll talk about it when we get to that, or if it's broader than what um, we can talk about today, perhaps we can uh, find a time to connect either by phone or email, and uh, hopefully I can help you with your question at that time. So uh, as I mentioned before, the, and you probably have seen, this presentation is going to be recorded, so just to let you know about that and then the need to um, press the, I guess it's the got it question or got it option, which will allow you to continue on. So I did, I just realized that I am in front of a true green screen. I didn't realize that um, I, we're, I'm in a conference room at my firm and, and they do a lot of the Zooming work here. So this must be up for a reason. But anyway, I think it's appropriate with Groundswell. So. Okay, so uh, if you could advance to the next slide. All right, so this is an overview of the topics that I'm gonna be talking about. First, about why and when to get started with your estate planning. And then we'll address some fundamental estate planning concepts uh, that is important for you to at least become familiar with um, in order to decide what type of estate planning might be right for you. And then why or how to include charitable giving as part of your plan. And then we'll, um, I'll offer you some tips for getting started. And then also we'll talk about what to expect from the estate planning process. So hopefully uh, this will give you a, a broad fundamental overview about the estate planning. So you can advance, please. Okay. Um, estate planning is really about helping you to manage the transitions in your life. Um, the, the process is focused on two points in time and building safety nets for those points in time. One is disability, or actually it's more of a um, more of a cognitive disability than, than actually a physical disability, ability, like a um, loss of um, ambulatory ability, uh, and then death. And through this process, you determine the who, what, where, when, how, and why things happen. And by creating your own estate plan, you are minimizing the reliance on the default rules. So as you can imagine, um, there's a lot of people out there that don't have an estate plan and transitions happen to them just like everybody else. And um, so the statutes have provided a default um, plan for you if you don't have your own estate plan. And very often the default rules will generate more costs associated with administering your transition uh, and also could produce results that you wouldn't necessarily want if you were to do your own plan. And the size of your estate should not be a determining factor. I think um, some people see their net worth as not being significant enough to put together an estate plan. And that's, um, not the case. And because really, as I mentioned, state planning is about managing the transitions and transitions happen to everybody. 
And so the estate plan that you put together may not have the type of, say, um, estate tax planning or generation skipping transfer tax planning that another estate um, person might need, but it also, it, it will include, um, or will have your ability to decide who uh, is in charge of taking care of the various questions that come up and making sure your property goes to the people that you want uh, to receive it in the way that you want them to receive it. So the other piece of advice that I have is that now is the right time to start. Um, pretty much every call I get from a person who's new uh, to estate planning is, is I've known I've needed to do this for you know fill in the blank number of many years. Uh, and I figured it's 2023, I'm gonna do it this year. And um, which is wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Uh, but hopefully with some of these tips for getting started, uh, you won't have the same um, hurdle to get getting started. And, and it's really, any, now is the time to start. It doesn't matter that you didn't do this 20 years ago. It just matters that you do it now. Okay. Um, all right, so uh, if you could advance the slide, Heidi. All right, so some fundamental concepts I think are important because they help, they will help you to evaluate what type of tool would be a good thing for you to have in your estate plan. First is the concept of probate. And probate is really a short-term way of saying the court supervised process for determining the validity of a will and distributing property pursuant to its terms. So that's a huge mouthful. So we just say probate. And um, so the, the probate process starts, um, it doesn't start immediately upon death. It starts afterwards. And uh, it may not start at all because you are, the collection of your assets when you die may not require uh, a court supervised process. And I'll go into some of the reasons why that might not be necessary, but, um, but it definitely doesn't start when death occurs. And I wanted just to give, uh, take a step back and just say what happens then. Um, uh, really nothing other than um, disposing of the person's remains and um, having the funeral or the memorial service, um, you know, greeting family if they're in town uh, and, and saying goodbye to your loved one. Really, that's, that's the process that's to start after the person dies. Um, our portion of it, the probate or the legal process can start after all of that other is done. But having said that, if um, the decedent hasn't done um, burial planning or um, disposition of remains planning before they died and also paying for that, then there needs to be some money, money set aside to cover the costs associated with disp disposing of the remains because the funeral um, uh, company or uh, any of the places that you can go to now really do want to get paid shortly after body has been disposed of. So it's good in your planning process, sort of uh, understanding what might be required of the people that you're asking to take care of things is to set aside some money or prepay some of those um, plans uh, so that they've got that taken care of after you die. Okay, so then the legal process starts. And the first is um, if a probate's necessary, then um, paperwork is filed and an individual or a corporate fiduciary is appointed to serve as the personal representative or the executor. That's another uh, word. We don't use that in Wisconsin because of our state statutes, but executor is the same as personal representative uh, for the of the decedent's death. And um, if you have a will, that's one of the things that's covered in the will. So you nominate somebody to be that personal representative. And um, But if you don't have a will, then that this is one of the default rules is that the court will appoint pretty much whoever comes to the courthouse first asking to be appointed. And that person may not be the one that you want. So that's, you know, one reason to have a will. But um, the personal representative's fees, I know there was a question that came in how to pay for that, uh, that person. It's, they generally take a percentage of the net value of the assets subject to probate. And the percentage that the statutes has is, is 2%. Um, but that can be either raised if there's a huge amount of work that needs to be done or lowered if there's just not much that's necessary at all. Um, then once the paperwork is started and you're appointed as personal representative, then 
a claims period is um, initiated. And that uh, is generally three and a half months after the date that the probate was opened. So um, a legal notice is published in the paper to give um, sort of general notice to creditors that could be out there. But if you um, if you have no if you have creditors, distinct creditors, or the person you're probating their estate for does have uh, has debts, then it's good to send letters to those creditors so that they have specific notice of the death and of the claims period so that they can file the claim during that period. Um, if they file later than that three and a half month period, then very often they're going to be out of luck in terms of getting paid. So that's that's an important period to get started and so that you know when it ends. Uh, then a list of the decedent's property subject to probate um, is filed with the court and then the filing is done listing the, the assets and then their date of death values. And then the decedent's bills are paid. Those are the, the ones that um, are valid, the claims that were filed, taxes filed, um, real estate sold, if there's any real estate, uh, final account is prepared, distributions are made, probate is closed. And the court likes to see this happen all within one year. So a lot is, is can be required. There's opportunities to extend that period, but generally they start getting, the court starts getting anxious. Um, if it's not done within a reasonable period of time within that one year time frame, So, so that's something to keep in mind. Probate, it's a court supervised process and it, it is there for property subject to probate. Okay, the other, if you could advance the slide. Okay, the other um, concept that I think is important before we get started is really what is marital property? Um, so this is a property classification system that applies by default if you're a resident of the state of Wisconsin and you're married. And the classification system can be modified by agreement. So um, marital property is um, compensation. So once you become subject to marital property, this then, then the classification system, then your compensation sub is subject to marital property, earnings on your individual property, individual property that is co-mingled with marital property that's difficult to trace. Those are all examples of marital property. So with marital property, ownership is presumed to be 50-50, regardless of which spouse is on the name of the account. So, um, and that is opposed to individual property, which is property brought to the marriage that is kept separate or property received by gift or inheritance during the marriage. So, when you're thinking about your estate, it's good to understand how this classification system could apply to you. Because um, even though your name is say on an investment account, if you're married and your property is subject to marital property classification, it may be that you only have the ability to determine what happens to 50% of that um, value of that account. So it's good to get an understanding of how you might fall within that. And if the default, presumption rules do not, um, you know, they're not something you want to um, just go with, then a marital property classification agreement is going to be necessary for you and your spouse to enter into to vary the application of that classification system. Okay, the next slide. All right, um, then another um, concept is what is a will? Well, a will is a legal document that coordinates the distribution of an individual's or testator's, that's another term for the individual, real and personal property that is subject to probate at death. In Wisconsin, a will must be in writing and the testator may sign it in the present or must sign it in the presence of two disinterested witnesses. So um, a disinterested witness would be somebody that's not named in the will um, and uh, probably that's not, not related to you as well. So, um, it's important to have both that the will be signed and signed in the presence of two disinterested witnesses. Some states have um, that a different um, system and that you can use say the back of a cocktail nap napkin and write down your disposition um, intentions and that's your, your will. Uh, but Wisconsin doesn't have that. It needs much more formality when you're signing a will. And also, if you make any amendment to your will, also called a codicil, those same formalities need to be observed. So um, as I mentioned before, a will is used to nominate the testator, or I'm sorry, the personal representative who will be in charge of administering your estate. 
And it also can be used to distribute tangible personal property, make specific gifts, and then uh, to decide how to distribute your the residue of your pro, uh, property subject to probate. So next slide, please. So the question number, first question is, do I need a will? Well, first again, um, determine the type of property that you own. Um, do you own property subject to probate? And that would be property that can't be titled. So that tangible personal property, for example, um, property that is titled only in your name. So an investment account only in your name uh, and uh, property that isn't designated to go to somebody else by beneficiary designation or co-titling. So, um, uh, so this is property not subject to probate would be retirement accounts with beneficiary designations completed, life insurance again with be de um, beneficiary designations completed, POD, POD accounts or TOD accounts, those are payable on death or transfer on death and property that is titled in your name and at least one other person's name. So if you have a mixture of that type of property, then absolutely you need a will. Uh, if you have property that's not subject to probate, then um, you, you may not need a will, but I'll go through some of the advantages or disadvantages of not having one um, in, in the next slide, but that's just something to keep in mind. And also, um, the marital property classification issue factors into here. So it's, and that's at the very first bullet point, point determine the type of property that you own. So if you have an account um, that's in your name and you're subject to marital property, then you may not own more than 50% of that account. So keep that in mind. Okay, so if you could advance. Okay, advantages of a will. Well, um, it gives you the ability to consider a beneficiary's individual characteristics, circumstances, and needs. Uh, you, can, you can make a disposition to friends or charities with a will and enables you to appoint a personal representative and a guardian. So you've got people in the various responsible positions that you want to serve rather than somebody that comes to the courthouse first or a professional that the probate commissioner may know and would be available to do the work. Okay, and it also enables you to build your own succession plan for the management of your estate and for the dis distribution of your property. So um, now this is opposed to the disadvantages and um, the disadvantages that you're subject to the laws of intestate succession, which I'll go through in just a minute. But um, so the next question, uh, next slide, please, which is um, and other questions related to do you need a will? Well. Do you have a unique family situation? Are you in a second or subsequent marriage? Um, do, you have do you have kids from the first marriage? Or are you in a partnership where there's kids from a prior relationship? Um, do you have family members with unique needs? Do you want to give to charity? Or do you want to make non-standard distri distributions? And do you have minor children? These are all questions to ask, uh, whereby if you're saying yes to these, then a will is a good thing for you to have. Now, as, as a legal professional, I think a, a will is really important. It makes so much um, sense in terms of uh, minimizing chaos that could happen when probating an estate, but um, you know, that's, that's my perspective. Okay, then the second, next slide, please. Um, okay, so um, then the question is, what is a living trust? Well, it's a, it's a contractual agreement between the person establishing the trust, which is also called a grantor, grantor or settlor, and the person legally authorized to manage the trust property, which is called the trustee. The trust agreement sets forth the powers and duties of the trustee and designates the beneficiaries of your trust property. So if you could advance the slide, please. So some of the advantages of a living trust, well, um, it's very similar to the advantages to a will but will enable you to avoid probate if it's properly funded. So if you have property in your own name that's not designated to go to another person, um, or if you have property outside, of, particularly real property outside of the state of Wisconsin, um, these are things that you should consider in terms of the will versus trust question, which one do I need? Now, a living trust, um, the word living uh, um, gives you a hint that this is revocable. So 
very often you'll see, um, you know, Sam Smith revocable trust, sometimes Sam Smith revocable living trust. Those all mean the same. It's all revocable by Sam. And um, so if you change your mind uh, as to provisions of your trust, you can change it without too much trouble. Um, and you can take property out of a trust that you have retitled the name of the trust, and then you can put it back in on, on an as needed basis. That also enables you to appoint a successor trustee for managing your property. Um, and it also provides privacy. Now, probate is a public process. That doesn't mean, so if you have a will and you have um, property subject to probate, there's, there's a um, file that's opened up for that process. And you can see on CCAP that the file was opened up and what's been submitted, who the various responsible parties are, what's happened, what the court has responded with. And for most people, um, others aren't going to care very much. But if you have notoriety with, you know, associated with your name or there's dynamics in your family where privacy would be important, then you probably don't want to have just a will, but you probably want a living trust and make sure that that is um, funded, meaning properties titled um, in the name of the trust to avoid probate. Um, now, there was a question in terms of if I have a trust, living trust, do I need a will? And the answer is yes, but the roadmap for distribution of your property is going to be in the living trust agreement. Um, what's going to be in your will, if you have both, is that the will will appoint a personal representative so that if something isn't titled in the name of the trust when you die that needs to go to the trust, you've appointed somebody to make sure that that gets done. And it also provides the direction that if that, say, you um, inherited a piece of property in, I don't know, um, Minnesota, uh, it, it provides the direction that the property is to go to your trust and then your trust would, would uh, be the roadmap in terms of what happens with that property. But you, so you do need both. Most of the time, any reliance on the will will be very small, particularly if you engage in some retitling exercises after you sign the trust document, which I always advise people to do so that it actually does and, uh, avoid probate. But so you do need both. Okay, next, next slide. Okay, so the disadvantages of a trust, well, it can be cumbersome to set up. And, and it's a more complex document than a will. Um, it involves, as I mentioned, the retitling exercises. So if you have a real estate, your home or other property, um, deeds will need to be prepared to transfer your property into the trust. Um, accounts may need to be retitled into the name of the trust or payable on death to the trust. So it's, it's, it's important that you have not only the trust agreement, but you have retitling so that your loved ones aren't faced with, well, I thought there was this trust and now we have to do probate. What is that all about? So that you set it up so that it really does do what you want it to do when you die. And then also there's a learning curve because it's a more complicated document it involves retitling. All of those things can be um, sort of disadvantages of, of a trust. But um, my perspective, if you look at the advantage of the trust and um, you're interested in privacy, you're interested in getting things as efficient and uh, well organized as possible after your death, then, or for after your death, then a trust is a really good idea to consider. Also, if you've got real property outside the state of Wisconsin. Um, and, and we would be here to work with you to understand the trust and so that it's not a complete um, question mark as to what you just signed. So, um, so that's, that's about a trust. Okay, so if you could advance the slide, please. All right, so what happens if you don't have a will or a trust? Well, I mentioned the laws of intestate succession, and it's essentially an order rule, uh, ordering rule, and that um, kind of is based on a family tree, and that property passes to your surviving heirs. Um, if, let's see, if there's a surviving spouse, then the spouse receives all, unless you have a child or children from a previous relationship. If you have child, child or children from a previous relationship, then the spouse retains his or her one half interest in the marital property 
and receives one half of the of your non-marital property. And the balance goes to your um, child or children uh, by right of representation. So it can result in a strange co-ownership between um, your current spouse and children from a previous relationship. And when it comes to say homes um, or uh, items in the home or other things that the two of you have enjoyed together, that can oftentimes relate or re result in some awkward um, dynamics. But if there isn't a surviving spouse, then it goes to your issue, which is children, grandchildren, so on. Um, and then parents, if you don't have children, up to parents. And then to siblings, if you don't have a sibling, but there's nieces or nephews, it goes to them. Um, and then if there's no surviving relatives, then it, it sheets to the state. Uh, so it goes to the Department of Revenue. So, um, you know, it's good if you are in a very small family or you're the last one remaining uh, and you don't want to benefit the Department of Revenue, then it's good to have some sort of document in place to make sure that that doesn't happen. The laws of intestate succession do not include charities. It doesn't allow for um, unequal distributions. It doesn't allow for special needs planning. So if you have a family member that is receiving means-tested benefits, where if they would receive something um, through the laws of intestate succession, they're going to be um, hurt. This, there's no way to prevent that unless you've got a will or a trust. And then it doesn't allow you to appoint a personal representative or a guardian for your minor children. So these are all good things to keep in mind in terms of deciding whether or not having a will or a trust is a good idea. Okay, next slide. Okay, so that is, those are the tools that I think um, are a lot of people's main focus when they start estate planning. And those really come into play after you die. But before you die, there could be need for assistance, very likely will be need for assistance. And uh, the way to do this is to, um, to appoint somebody to serve on your behalf. And if you're unable to manage your financial affairs because of mental incapacity and haven't given someone else the ability to do that or the legal authority to do so, then um, without that, then you have to go to, or the person will have to go to court to get named the guardian of your estate. So a way to avoid that is to have a durable power of attorney for finances and property. And this is written authorization given by you as the principal to enable another your agent to act on behalf of you with respect to financial matters. And it could be effective immediately. So when you sign it, you um, it could be effective. And that not that you're handing over your ability to manage your, your financial affairs. It just means that if you need somebody to help you, they're to act on your behalf and at your direction. Um, if you if you don't, if that's not comfortable for you, then you can have what's called a springing power of attorney for finances and property. And that would be um, springing based on a determination that you're unable to manage your affairs because of incapacity. And um, there's different types of incapacity that you can look at. One is incapacity for healthcare matters and the other is incapacity for financial matters. And, and um, the financial ability to manage your financial affairs very often is the first to become frayed as, as you age. And so um, if you're looking to have it springing, my advice would be have it springing based on a determination of inability to manage finances as opposed to inability to manage healthcare questions. And the scope can be broad or limited. Um, a broad power grants your agent the ability to take action on your behalf in a multitude of scenarios, uh, say selling real estate on your behalf, making investments on your behalf, filing tax returns on your behalf, things like that. A limited power of appointment, or sorry, power of attorney um, is there if you just need somebody to help you, say you're out of town, your property is going to be sold, you appoint somebody to serve as your limited power of attorney just for purposes of closing on that real estate deal. So it, it can be, there's some variety there. And as far as choosing an agent, um, with technology these days, the proximity of the person you choose is becoming less and less important. 
So your agent doesn't necessarily need to be in the same city or even state as you are. Um, but I think if you are considering uh, uh, some people, you would um, keep in mind that, or, or consider their specific financial situation. Um, and if someone's having financial troubles, they may not be the best person to have step into your, your shoes as your agent. Um, there's a lot of opportunities for conflict of interest that could come up. Um, and very often, if mistakes are made, it's hard to reverse those mistakes. And so you may have a more limited quality of life based on limited finances than you thought was going to be your case. So, okay, um, can you advance to the next slide, please? All right, um, then uh, what will happen if you can't make your healthcare decisions? Well, similar to the financial power of attorney, um, you would uh, appoint somebody to serve on your behalf with the power of attorney for healthcare. And this is a document that's in writing where you give authorization to an, another, your agent, to act on your behalf with respect to healthcare decisions. And this is one of those that um, you sign it now and it doesn't do anything now. What has to happen is that it needs to be activated. Um, and it's by two physicians or a physician and a, a, a psychiatrist after determination of incapacity. And, and at that point, then many of the powers that you enjoy over um, decisions, your healthcare decisions, transfer to the people that you name in the order that you name them. And there are certain things that don't transfer with that, but um, much much does and um, it avoids, like the financial power of attorney, it avoids having to have a guardianship initiated. Uh, this would be guardian of the person to be nominated. And um, if you are in an emergency situation and your spouse is there or you have a child that's there, very often the healthcare providers that are attending to your needs will go to those people to um, get direction in terms of what happens next. But once you're beyond the emergency situation, if you don't have a healthcare power of attorney, then they're going to say that they, your spouse, your child has to go to court to get named your guardian. So uh, this is a good thing to have. And it, it I guess, solves a lot in terms of um, uh, ambiguities that could happen once the emergency period is over. And also it's a lot more cost effective to do this. And then the living will, this is a direction to your physician or agent to withhold or withdraw life-sustaining procedures or feeding tubes if your death is imminent. And there's a number of different types of living wills that are out there now. There's the declaration of physicians, with the, which is a state form. There's an addendum, which is an attachment to the healthcare power of attorney. And then there's the a form called honoring choices. And um, the ability to make a more specific direction um, is with the last one, the honoring choices. And so for those of you that have um, real uh, distinct thoughts about end of life care. That's something you may wanna consider because you're able to provide guidance that's beyond just withhold or withdraw feeding to, or um, you know, admit me to a skilled nursing facility for long-term stays. It's, it can be much more nuanced than that. And then there's the HIPAA um, or HIPAA release or the healthcare information release form. And I think this is really good. Um, it helps, helps the people that you've asked to help help you. So it's a good tool to have. Um, what you've done with this release is you have released um, covered entities, which is essentially your, your attending physicians, the healthcare system that they're part of, your health insurance company, from restrictions that would prevent them from sharing your protected health information. Um, and it allows for that sharing to occur just with the people that are on the list. So my advice would be to have your healthcare agents on that list, your financial agents on that list because of the, the cross-section that often happens between health and finances. And then also if you have other people in your life that would like, you know, would like to, um, you would like them to know what's going on and to be able to speak with the physician, then I would put those on that form too. And of those forms, the power of attorney for healthcare power to do finances, for finances, the living will, the HIPAA release. It's the healthcare forms that need to be shared with your health, primary healthcare provider. And um, I know that if you're on a MyChart system, you can, and you have those documents in electronic form, you can upload those to your file and then they're saved to your file. 
um, or bring them in with you to your next appointment. But it's good for them to have them so that they know that if something happens, this is what you want. Um, this is not a um, DNR or do not resuscitate, resuscitate um, direction. That's something that you would get from your physician. And very often they won't do it until uh, your death is, is imminent or you're in a very fragile position. But um, these other ones are very good. And as I mentioned, will help minimize, if not reduce entirely, the need for guardianship to occur. Okay, so um, I'm going longer than what I thought I would. Uh, I still have charitable giving to talk about and some tips. Do people want me to continue on? I don't want to keep. Yes, continue on. Okay, okay, great. All right, um, so on to the next slide, please. Okay, so should I consider charitable giving? Well, there's a number of non-financial reasons. Well, um, pay it forward um, and the emotional uplift that's created uh, when you make a gift. And it also creates a culture of collaboration and community involvement when you give. And it's really needed by the recipient, uh, particularly as budgets are cut and, and more scrutiny is, is applied to what previously, when previous administrations was considered a, a viable expenditure of, of public funds. With that going away, um, the need is, is really, really great at this time. So those are my reasons, I think, and you may have others, other non-financial reasons that you think is, are important to um, drive charitable giving. But there's also tax reasons to, to make charitable gifts. Um, so gifting to a charity during your life may earn you an income tax deduction or may reduce your portable income. And then giving to a charity through your estate plan after death gives you an estate tax charitable deduction if that's something that's important to you. So if you could advance to the next. Um, okay, so um, ways to gift during your lifetime. Well, um, you could give appreciated stock or real estate. Now, there's a question about donations of, of stock and if that's different from regular types of donations like cash. Well, um, uh, yes, in, in some ways, um, in that your donation of appreciated stock is counted for uh, donation deduction purposes at, at the fair market value of that stock. So it's more efficient for you to donate the stock than it is to sell the stock and donate the net proceeds from the sale of the stock. Because if you do, if you do the second, sell the stock and then donate the proceeds, you're going to have a capital gains tax on the difference between your cost basis in the stock, so what you purchased it at or received it as a gift, uh, or through inheritance and what the um, sale price was. So you can give more if you donate appreciated property. Real estate's another example of that. But um, before you do or consider doing either one, particularly with real estate, I would make sure that you communicate with the charity that you're interested in helping because they most do have a means to um, handle appreciated stock, but some may not have a means to handle appreciated real estate and would rather another type of gift be made and can work with you on that. So um, the, I guess the net, net advice is talk to the charity and see what's gonna be the best. But from a tax perspective, from, from a donor's perspective, appreciated property is always good. And then there's the qualified charitable distribution. And some of you may already be doing this. This is for a donor who's at least 72 years old and um, requires, is required to withdraw a minimum distribution. And um, they instead, rather than taking that RMD, they can transfer up to 100,000 a year from their retirement account to charity. And all the amounts that are rolled over to the charity through this QCD opportunity um, will not be reported to you on your form 1099-R. So you don't get a charitable contribution deduction, but you also don't have to include that amount in your taxable income. So that's something to consider. Okay, the next slide. All right, so other ways to get through your estate plan and um, life insurance and tax deferred retirement benefits are great because naming a charity um, in this manner uh, doesn't impact your quality of life now. 
you know, your finances now. This is something that will come about after you die. And, and so you don't have to worry about, am I gonna have enough if I get very sick towards the end of my life? Um, with respect to tax deferred retirement benefits, that's also good because the charity, if it's a 501c3 organization, won't pay tax on the money that they receive through a, a tax deferred retirement account. So you are making your dollars more efficient and that similar to the appreciated stock example is that um, they don't have to pay tax on that. So um, they get more of the money. If you were to name a charity as part of your will or trust and leave your retirement benefits to children, well, your children would have to pay tax on what they took from the, the retirement benefit. Um, so they would get less um, and the charity you know, would not, either, so they would get less and it, it's probably more efficient for you to name them under other portions of your estate plan and name the charity as a beneficiary of a retirement account for those reasons. And then outright distributions of property. Um, so if you have um, valuable artwork, if you have um, other property, real estate, if you, um, you know, have uh, coins, things like that, that you think might benefit a charity, you can make those gifts um, through your will or trust, or you can also make those gifts during your lifetime. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so um, some things to keep in mind um, in terms of when you're making decisions about who should be appointed and how they should work and, and how your estate plan is going to be managed. So. Um, First question to ask is, will your healthcare agent, financial agent, your successor trustee, and personal representative work well together? And, and that's critical because if they don't work well, then there's going to likely be a, um, a grinding to a halt of the forward movement. And then the second is, have you funded your uh, living trust? And that's, I mentioned before that Funding is also another word for retitling. And if you haven't retitled or funded your living trust, then it's not likely going to help with avoiding probate. And then do your beneficiary designations for your retirement accounts or POD or TOD accounts or life insurance support or contradict your estate plan? Um, it's Im important to understand um, how those work together, your estate plan and those types of designations work together because it's possible that you could be putting together a roadmap for distribution of your property in your will or trust agreement that you hope is funded with accounts that are sitting, say, at an investment house or, or in a bank. But if you do a POD or TOD on those accounts, they would go to the people that you've named as a designated beneficiary rather than according to your will or your trust agreement. And I've seen this happen and it's really unfortunate because you could have a situation where real estate's distributed according to your will, but there's no funds to pay for costs related to the real estate or um, costs related to other types of distributions you want that are only named in your will. So it's good to have those pieces all coordinated and um, also to be aware that if and I, I don't mean to slam um, people in the financial services industry, but because I think they're well-meaning in hoping to help you to avoid probate, but they're suggesting POD or TOD on accounts without knowing what your other documents provide. And so it in essence creates this really difficult situation for somebody who's trying to manage your estate after you die. And then another question is, should I write a letter of last instruction? Um, this is an optional document. It's it's just, I think, important if you have specific um, thoughts to share with your beneficiaries, if you have um, information that you wanna communicate, uh, particularly related to a memorial service or a funeral service, um, I would get those down in writing. It shouldn't be something that you look at as like an addendum to your will um, or a, an amendment to a trust that should be handled within the, the will or the trust um, regime. This is really should just be about additional information to your beneficiaries and, and your family. So some people really like that and um, others don't feel that it's necessary. So that's up to you. But if you're gonna prepare one, make sure that you keep it with your estate planning documents and let your 
family know where that is so that they don't um, go forward thinking that you want a full-blown funeral with all the bells and whistles. And what you really want is to a natural burial. And they realize that after they ever, after the funeral's done and um, they're starting the legal process of your administering your estate. So just make sure that people know where that is. Okay, uh, next, next slide, please. Okay, then the accepted rule of thumb for um, reviewing an estate plan once you have it is every three to five years. And this really gets back to the perspective that I suggest people um, take on when they start their estate planning. And, and it's really hard. It's very, it's hard to do. It's it, not to do this, but it's, it's very easy to get wound up and then um, tied up so tightly you can't make any decisions because you start thinking about oh gosh, what's my child going to be like 25 years from now? Or um, I don't even know where we're going to be 25 years from now. Or um, this person's really having troubles right now. I don't know, you know what I should do to help them if they're going to be that way 25 years from now. So my suggestion is to approach your estate planning process as if you were to die tomorrow, knowing that's really likely not going to happen. Uh, and then just promise yourself that you're going to have your plan reviewed every three to five years. Now, the younger you are, probably the closer to five years, that would be fine. But as you age, that three-year time for your period is probably more appropriate and sometimes even two or one years. Because again, your plan should review your um, priority, or sorry, your plan should reflect your priorities and goals. And rather than reflect priorities and goals that you had 25 years ago, that may not be applicable now. Also, the review will, will um, catch changes in the applicable law. We had just went through a really big change with respect to retirement accounts. And so we uh, wrote to people that we had worked with and said, this has happened. Uh, this may impact your plan. Um, give us a call if you're interested in, in having us review it. And um, this is something that does generate fees. I won't be, you know, um, I won't be, uh, I'm going to be transparent about that. But um, it's important because those change can changes can result in a really unfortunate occurrence. And um, sometimes there isn't any laws that have changed or not then it would really apply to you. And a review would um, would be consist of just, okay, everything looks fine. Do you wanna change anything? And if there's something you wanna change, we do it, but there's nothing that's really driving that change from our perspective. And then um, what could happen to you or your spouse if your plans are outdated? Well, um, you could have a guardianship uh, be necessary. Uh, you could um, have somebody receive property that you wish they wouldn't receive or in a way that you wish they wouldn't receive. Things like that can happen. So um, I think it's good to keep your plans current and, and just make that a, a part of the process that you keep in mind. Okay, now on to tips. So if you could. Okay, um, these are things that I put together just from the years that I've been practicing and questions that have come up, uh, people have asked me or things that I've observed um, in, in clients and finding out things that would be helpful to them. Okay, so know the age of your existing plan if you have one. So if again, if it's the 25 year old plan, make sure you're aware of that so that um, you can update that and, and as necessary. And then collect information on your assets, your debts, your income needs, and beneficiary designations. Um, think about who you would like to appoint as your financial agent, your healthcare agent, personal representative, successor trustee, if you have one, a trust, and the necessary guardians for your minor children. Think about your distribution goals and your intended beneficiaries. Now, having said that, um, you may not have answers to any or, or some of these questions. Um, don't worry about that. We can go through what information you do have and then also talk about uh, options for you to consider. So to somewhat narrow the scope of decisions that you need to make. Um, then please keep in mind the importance of renewals and the scope of your current plan and then identify any family issues or special needs that could be relevant to your plan. For example, do you have, are you in a second or third marriage? Do you have children from a prior relationship? Do you have a special needs child or a special needs family member that 
uh, needs to have any inheritance they would receive be treated in a special manner. Okay, uh, now next slide, please. Okay, um, what to expect? Well, honestly, you should receive a call back within a relatively short period of time after you place an initial call to the attorney. Sometimes they can't get to them for a day, maybe a day and a half, but it, it shouldn't go longer than that. Um, you'll likely be asked to provide the attorney with specific in information about your family and your assets and your goals. Um, and you, you can and you should ask about fees, but you may not receive a full answer until the attorney knows more about your goals and specific circumstances. Um, and then the attorney should prepare drafts for you to review on your own, and then also set aside time um, to go through those with the attorney. And then please let the attorney know that if you see edits that need to be made, that they, that they know that they should be made. And also if you have any questions, and then let the attorney know if you're happy or alternatively, if you see things that need to be improved with their process, your feedback is really important and um, your experience uh, makes a difference and can make a big difference for people that, that um, are, are seeing the attorney after you. So, so with that, um, thank you very much. I'm wondering if there's any questions that I can address right now. don't see any questions in the um, meeting chat, but if anybody does have any questions right now for Johanna, please feel free to speak up. We do certainly have a few minutes left. So now's the time to take advantage of, of having this estate attorney in front of you. Joanna, hi, my name is Chris Gutschenrunner. Thanks for this presentation. Um, I recently received uh, the estate plan for my parents, mm -hmm. uh, in which I'm named as as the person responsible for handling everything after they mm -hmm. after they pass. And it's a little bit overwhelming. Um, and this, I am an attorney, and this is still overwhelming for me. Um, but they they have a they have a will. They have two different trusts set up. And then they've got all of their uh, powers of attorney for finances and, and healthcare and whatnot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But one, uh, in their trusts, they, they have a living revocable trust. And then they also have an irrevocable trust uh, named uh, an I, IPUG. IPUG, okay. I, yeah. IPUG, yeah. Uh -huh. Can you, uh, neither, which, neither of which are funded right now. Can you walk me through which First of all, what are the differences between the two, the, li the, the living revocable trust and the, and the IPUG? Uh, so did you say that both parents have died now? No, no, no. They're both still They're both alive, alive. And, alive okay. and kicking. Okay. So um, the revocable living trust is an assay, I'm sorry, the probate avoidance device um, for property that they have, they, they retained ownership of, you know, that they want to control. Um, the IPUG is an irrevocable trust that's usually done in connection with special needs or um, sort of Medicaid planning. And it is structured in a way to allow them to receive some of the benefits of the assets in the trust, but not be counted for as a countable resource the, the, with respect to Medicaid um, application um, requirements. So, um, you know, I, I don't draft IPUGs. Um, I'm familiar with them. Um, but uh, has it, I guess it's unusual that it's not funded. Did, did you know a reason why they didn't fund it? Uh, honestly, I think my parents lost confidence in the attorney that they're working with. And so they got these documents the, the uh, will is signed and countersigned by the two unrelated um, individuals. Okay. Um, and my understanding was that they sort of lost confidence and then they just set it aside. Sure. Um, well, the good thing is not funded then because um, then you don't have to, they can, they can get rid of it um, if you don't, if it doesn't make sense given their overall estate um, and net worth. But 
um, the revocable living trust, I think that's something to, to keep and to take advantage of it since they went through the, the hassle, so to speak, of getting it in place. Um, and it, it will avoid probate if, if it can be properly funded. Uh, and it's it can be it's flexible. It's something that they can make changes to over time. So, okay. um, IPUGs I don't think are very much in favor, even among the um, the spell, uh, elder law or special needs planning attorneys. But um, but it's good it's not funded, so you don't necessarily need okay. it. So. And then I, I have one other question, and I hope it to be quick. But there is a a special needs beneficiary. Uh, and some considerations for those needs are made in both of those documents that we've referenced and are referenced in the will as well. Okay. Um, uh, is is that so to, to carry it to execute the the considerations that they're making for the special needs mm -hmm. individual um, is a separate trust intent is a separate trust commonly set up after their death at the time the distributions are being made. Um, How does that generally yeah. work? So it sounds like what they have is called a third party special needs trust. That's exactly right. Yeah. Okay. So that can be done while they're alive. It also can yeah, be done after yeah. they die. Um, and, okay. and so, um, you know, it's really the specific circumstances of your family in terms of when to put that into effect. Um, but very often there's language in the trust agreement that allows for either that type of trust to be funded after death or you know, some sort of sub account with the pooled community trust, which is also focused on special yeah. beneficiaries. So uh, if you'd like, I'd be happy to take a look at those documents and provide you some guidance. The IPUG, I, I wouldn't be qualified to provide much advice, just as I mentioned, because I don't, I don't throw out. Yeah. So. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. Johanna, there is one other question here that is, are you available to assist with will preparation? Yes, I am. And I work um, as part of a team. Um, my, um, my team, I, I'm a senior attorney, and then I've got a couple of associates that I work with, and then paralegals and my wonderful legal assistant. So um, yes, we, we can help you and, um, and, and uh, work with you. I meet with you and, and take care of what you are looking to do. So. There, is, there is one more question now, Johanna. Are there professionals who can act as personal representative, trustee, design, designee of powers of attorney, et cetera, how to choose them? Yeah, so um, it depends on the role that you're looking to fill. So um, there are professional patient advocates that will serve as healthcare agent if you don't have anybody to name. Um, there are professional um, people who will serve as financial agents. Um, those, the, 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 pa the patient advocates generally are in the nursing profession. Um, and very often they have considerable experience in working with um, elders and people with special needs. Um, the financial agent piece, it's usually an attorney or somebody who's acted as guardian of the estate for a, a number of people. But you can also name a, a bank or a trust company. And they, up until very recently, were extremely hesitant to serve as financial agent because there's liabilities associated with that. But they have, um, and also restrictions in terms of their professional um, uh, certifications. But those have eased up somewhat. So some of the banks will do that. Some of them will do that so long as um, they're able to transfer certain assets to their bank that you might have so they can manage those. Um, and then there's one financial organization, um, it's called Fiduciary Partners, put a little plug in there for them, um, that they'll serve and they don't do asset management. So they just would serve in that role. So, um, and, um, for personal representative and trustees, it's the same thing is that you can you can hire an attorney, you can or name a nominated attorney, you can nominate um, a corporate fiduciary. Um, and so there, there's a lot of different options to consider in terms of what your goals are and also what your estate is to um, what might be best. Because they will charge for their time. And um, you know, it's just important to understand that in terms of when when to bring them in, 
and, and the complexity of your estate too. Sometimes family dynamics can drive complexity. So it may be just wise to sidestep that whole thing and hire somebody to help uh, so that nobody's in the middle of all that. You would not have a unique family if that was the case, I'll tell you that. So, um, but, uh, so you've got plenty of options there. Any other questions? These are good questions. I don't know how to raise my hand, but I got a question. <laughs> sure. Um, real quick one. So I've got uh, some accounts and PODs, but the beneficiary is 100% my significant other. And I, that the, but now I've just realized if we were to die together in a plane crash, for example, then that money would go without a secondary beneficiary. That would go back to probate, would it not? Yes, it would. And and you're right about that timing. I was going to mention this. I, I didn't, I don't think I did mention this. Um, that the laws of intestate succession require survivorship of 120 hours for the person to inherit. So if you go down in a plane together, they'll be inherits. And so it goes to your estate. And then um, if you have a will, it would be transferred according to your will. If not, then it's laws of intestate succession. Okay, but PODs could have 100% to one person, and then you could have secondaries. Is that correct? Yes. Sometimes they, yeah. I think most of the time you can do that, and that's great. Um, the But sometimes they stop, and it's, that's unusual, though. Um, the, the thing, though, is if you do POD and your contingent beneficiaries, or even your primary beneficiaries, if they are disabled or if they are um, a minor, then if you you need some sort of protective account to receive the money, but because by law, a person who's under the age of 18 or incapacitated or incompetent can't um, receive an inheritance like that. So you may want, even with the POD, to coordinate um, with a will so that the will has that protected account envisioned. And so that if the contingency does come to play, then there's a way to avoid having to initiate a guardianship just to receive the money for that beneficiary. Okay, but if I have a POD adults, no kids, POD is a significant other, uh, right now 100% to her, but then I could, to avoid probate, list as secondaries, my siblings, for example. And then, right. so if I died, she would get 100%, but if we died together, I would have secondaries who could get it and we'd avoid probate. Right. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? No. 